Welcome to our lesson that provides an overview of reactive programming principles. In this part of the lesson, you'll understand the key benefits and principles that underlie reactive programming, including responsiveness, resilience, elasticity, and a so-called message-driven implementation architecture. Reactive programming is an asynchronous programming paradigm that's concerned with processing streams of data and propagating changes throughout that stream. It composes asynchronous and event-based sequences that use various types of operators to do filtering and transformations and so on. Ideally, these operators are non-blocking, which means that the caller doesn't have to wait for the computations to be completed. The operators can also be mapped transparently to one or more threads, which are typically provided by something called a scheduler, and are often organized into something called a thread pool, which is the, just a group of threads that work together in order to be able to amortize the creation and destruction costs of the threads. Programs designed using reactive programming often avoid the overhead of constantly starting and stopping threads. And this is one of the main benefits we'll see when we start taking a look at how to program with reactive programming environments shortly. Reactive programming can be used for various use cases, and it's ideally suited for the following ones. It's very useful for processing user events. And in modern graphical user interface environments, these user events are typically things like mouse movements or mouse clicks or touch events on a touch screen, like an Android device, GPS location signals, and so on and so forth. There's actually a nice environment called Rx Android, which is an Android variant of the famous Rx Java reactive streams environment. And it's especially oriented to handle various kinds of events or user events in the Android platform. Another type of use case that reactive programming is very well suited for is to respond to and process latency bound IO events. And the idea here is to avoid blocking again and to avoid making the system be non-responsive. A good example would ha be handling asynchronous network IO in a publisher subscriber environment. For example, you might have something like a Twitter feed that's sending out various tweets or messages. And these would then be put through a pipeline of event transformers, which are essentially operators that will be able to filter the events, search for various types of events, perhaps do things like sentiment analysis to see what, what uh, tweets are trending, group the tweets together in various con configurations, and then disseminate them out to one or more observers, which may want to listen to subsets of those events and display them somehow. And so there's a bunch of examples that you can see if you watch the video at the link at the bottom of the slide. Yet another good use case that we'll be covering quite a bit throughout this course is communicating between microservices in a modern web-based computing environment. For example, if you take a look at the WebFlux environment, which is a spring-based reactive programming framework for doing essentially web-based communication between clients and servers in a multi-tier architecture involving microservices. And you'll see some really great uses of the mechanisms we're going to be talking about here from reactive programming that can work across a network boundary. Reactive programming is based on four key principles, which are documented in the reactive manifesto that you can find in the link at the bottom of this slide. One of the key principles is responsiveness. And the idea behind this principle is to provide rapid and consistent response times. In other words, you don't want to delay users, you don't want to defer them getting the information, and therefore you want to be able to establish fairly reliable upper bounds that are needed to be able to deliver consistent quality of service and prevent any kind of user disruption, like the dreaded hourglass or the spinning wheel that you sometimes would see on Apple or Windows computers back in the day. Another key principle of reactive programming is resilience. And what this means is that the system will remain responsive even if some operators or some streams or some of the computations fail. In particular, failure of one operation or a small set of operations shouldn't bring the entire system collapsing. You want to be able to make the system be resilient to partial failure. Yet another key goal that's important is the concept of elasticity, which means that a system should remain responsive even under varying workload. In particular, as the workload goes up, you want the system to be able to auto scale to take advantage of more cores or in some cases, more computers. And we'll talk about ways of being able to handle this both for uh, 
single computers with multi-core processors, as well as clusters of computers that have many processors running on many cores and so on. The final principle, which is really a bit more of an implementation detail than the other three, is the concept of a so-called message-driven architecture. And what this means is that the infrastructure or the implementation of the reactive programming frameworks and platforms is based on asynchronous message passing, which ensures and enables loose coupling, isolation, you can move things around without worrying about where they run, which cores or which computers, and location transparency. So you're able to be able to pass the information back and forth and not really care too much about where the processing actually gets done. And you'll see that this is handled very cleanly and nicely in some of the reactive programming frameworks by the ability to indicate where you want the computations to run, what thread or threads the computations need to be mapped to. This is also an example of something called message-oriented middleware, which has been popular for the past 20 or 30 years in the communications infrastructure community. So that's the end of our video describing an overview of reactive programming principles.